Well, greetings, everybody. This is Dr. Ronald Brown, your favorite speaker, talking to you on another very timely topic. And the topic today is whatever happened to the gay revolution? Good question. Well, as we all know, June is the month of gay pride, parades all over the place, and especially here in New York, where I live. <clears throat> and so today I'm going to give a little bit of the history of the gay revolution, of course, bringing it up from the 1960s when it all began until today with the anti-gay backlash. So we'll start 60s, the age of revolutions. Number two, and the Stonewall Revolution, or as it was called in the press, the Stonewall Riots. And then what did these gay liberated people do? Lesbians, transsexuals, they set about building a gay utopia. Like any ethnic group in New York City or any other city, they took over a neighborhood, they built their infrastructure of an ethnic neighborhood, and literally became a city within a city. Sort of like New York with its Jewish neighborhoods, its Chinese neighborhoods, its Italian neighborhoods, Mexican, Hispanic neighborhoods. So every city has its gay neighborhood or neighborhoods. And then out of the ghetto and into the world, like every immigrant group, every ethnic group, you begin in your ghetto, but then you hope someday to move out of the ghetto and into the world. <clears throat> and then finally, where we are today, and hopefully won't remain here in the future, but who knows, and this is the anti-gay backlash. So once again, let's get going and find out what happened to the gay revolution. Well, the 1960s in the United States, where the gay revolution really took full form, was during the 1960s. <clears throat> like any age of revolutions, where there was the American Revolution of 1776, followed by the Haitian Revolution, the French Revolution, and then the various revolutions of Latin America. So the 1960s spawned a whole plethora of uh, revolutions, not just gays, lesbians, transsexuals, and uh, um, other people who rejected the standard definition of what it is to be a man or a woman, but a lot of other groups joined this revolution. In Africa, the 1960s was the age of uprisings against the British, the French, the Portuguese, and the Spanish in, the, in Africa, in places like Kenyatta. Gradual independence came. In fact, most of the countries of Africa got their independence during the 1960s. In South Asia, you had the rise of the Cambodians and Laotians and the Vietnamese against the French. Well, the French fought bitterly to keep their colonies in Asia. And when they gave up, finally, it was the United States who took over and tried to destroy Vietnamese independence and autonomy. But Ho Chi Minh won out. And in 1968, the war was well on its way for Vietnamese independence. Independence movements for Puerto Rico, uprisings against apartheid in South Africa, the Rye uprising of the Czechs against the Russian occupation of 1968, the various uprisings of the Palestinians against Israeli occupation and the, the destruction of their country. So the world in the 60s was awash with revolutions. These were people who were challenging the established economic, political, social, intellectual order and demanding independence. 
in the United States, Native Americans were rising up, demanding their lands be returned, demanding that their languages and religions be respected, that they be given a large degree of autonomy on their lands. Women, the women's movement was demanding the rights, full rights, equal rights with men. African-Americans under Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and so many other people were demanding their rights, which had been long denied them. Chicanos, the Hispanics in California, the Southwest and the rest of the country were rising up and saying, we are tired of being treated as nothing more than near slave labor. So the 1960s was a time of revolution. Even in the Catholic Church, Vatican Council number two decided to bring the Catholic Church kicking and screaming into the modern age. Get rid of ancient Latin languages, speak English or French or German or Chinese. Get rid of all these statues and all these other fancy decorations and go back to the Bible. The United States itself was being overwhelmed with new immigrants. The gates of immigration opened in 1968 with the Hart Cellar immigration, admitted millions of Hispanics, Asians, Middle Easterners, Africans, and the vast majority were non-white. Again, a demographic revolution in the United States. <clears throat> A sexual revolution was taking place in the 60s. First, you had 77 million babies called the baby boomers mer merging into the American population. Well, baby boomers like me, I was born in 1949 at the very beginning of the baby boom generation. We were large in numbers. We were born into a rich country where we could get an old used car. We were all going off to college away from our parents, and we had no intention of growing up to be like our parents. The pill liberated women from getting pregnant. They could have as much free and wild sex as men could without having to worry if they were getting pre pregnant. And if they did, abortion was legalized. And so there was a hospital or a clinic on every street in America. We were all going off to college. When I went to college, I mean, they couldn't put up dormitories fast enough. They couldn't build enough classrooms or hire enough professors to take care of all of these young people flooding into colleges. And the last thing the professors or our parents wanted to do was to try to control us. Many of us gave up completely and dropped out of college, went to California and joined a commune, experimenting with new societies. Free love, who wait until you got married to have sex anymore? Whatever the old generation said, it had no bearing on the baby boom generation. Plus, most baby boomers had no intention of getting married. I mean, we were too, having too much fun. The country was rich, the richest country in the world at the time. We dominated the world. The American dollar was all powerful. And so why get married? Why worry about the future? Enjoy the present. Well, that meant that this new generation was rejecting the synagogues and churches of their parents and ancestors. They weren't worried about having babies and raising kids and changing poopy baby deities. This was a time of absolute total freedom. TV shows like Leave it to Beaver celebrated the affluent life 
in the suburbs, a car, front yard, backyard, electrified kitchen, coffee makers, dishwashers, vacuum cleaners, lawn mowers. I mean, this was the golden age, what many scholars called the American century. Well, this new generation, we baby boomers, resisted any attempt to bring us under control. Sure, the Bible talked about Adam and Eve. Well, if Adam fell in love with Steve, well, then, okay, forget about the Bible. Be fruitful and multiply. Well, that was our parents' job. We were out to enjoy life. We rejected marriage as a sacrament until death do you part. In fact, nobody was even interested in getting married. Family values, mom, pop, and the kids. Well, when you are a young 19-year-old guy or girl off in college in California, the last thing you're worried about is what your parents are thinking. In fact, that's why you went to California, to escape your parents. And Leviticus 2013, condemning men laying with men and women with women. It was no longer an abomination. It was self-realization. It was growing. It was learning. It was discovering free sexuality. <clears throat> well, unfortunately, the 1950s and the 1960s, the society was not very welcoming to this new booby boom, baby boom generation. The United States was, after all, a religious country. I mean, uh, one nation under God was put on our money by President Eisenhower. It all uh, 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 was put on our Pledge of Allegiance. In God we trust, he put on our currency. I grew up praying in school before every um, day of classes. It was a time in the United States, a religious America, God's chosen country, was at war against the USSR, the godless atheism. And so the government, society, religious leaders, writers such as Will Herberg, who wrote Protestant, Catholic, and Jew, divided Americans into three legs of a stool, saying that American society was firmly based on a three-legged stool. One was Protestant, one was Catholic, and one was Jewish. Well, popular culture of the 50s and the 60s definitely let everybody know how they should be living. Father Knows Best. There was no show called Mother Knows Best. It was the patriarchal family. But you're in the middle. You see the kids going on vacation. Well, look at it. It's mom and pop in the front seat with a baby. Kids in the middle with their dog. Grandma sitting in the back. No old people's home for mama. It was everybody going to the beach together. Leave it to Beaver, another male-dominated television show, family show. Father Knows Best is a family unit. Barbie and Ken, the ideal American couple. Marriage, every girl was supposed to dream of being lifted off of her feet in her wedding gown, carried across threshold of their marriage bed, and there she would lose her virginity. Well, unfortunately, by the 1960s, that was a dream if there ever was one. Boys grew up in the Boy Scouts, whether it's Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, or Eagle Scouts, uh, creating a new generation of healthy, good-thinking, God-fearing, church-going men. And of course, this was all spread not just by Hollywood movies, but by the popularity of the television. And again, look at the advertisement. Television happiness shared by all the family. Again, reinforcing the male-dominated heterosexual family. Well, this was shoved down the throats of everybody in America 
following World War II, even before. The father was the head of the family. Well, just like in religion, God the father who had a son, father-son relationship. In church, they said, we're all children of God. God was a man, of course, running the show. And marriage was a sacrament taking place in churches and vowing until death to us part. And so the major religions of the world, especially the Christianity, Judaism uh, of the United States, as well as Islam, Confucianism, Hinduism, all celebrated the value of the heterosexual family. And, and political movements, not just the Eisenhower administration, but the fascists all but outlawed homosexuality, outlawed divorce and abortion in favor of a good, strong fascist family, as did communism and as did their religious right today in the United States, outlawing abortion, suppressing divorce, reinforcing family control over the children. So the heterosexual family rule, probably since time immemorial, and especially in the United States, following World War II. <clears throat> well, the baby boom generation was mobile. The car was the main means of transportation. Even a young kid, as soon as he got to be 16, got his driver's license, could always pick up an old clunker of a used car, spend half of his day getting it running, and then picking up his girlfriends driving around. When you went to college, you packed up and you wanted to get as far away from your family as you could. You live in California, you come to New York for college. If you live in New York, you go to California for college. If you live anyplace else in the United States, it was one of the big East Coast or West Coast cities that gave you the most freedom for these 77 million baby boomers who were late teenagers and early 20s. Well, large numbers of sexually liberated young people started gathering in what is today called Greenwich Village in New York City. Well, they had their bars called similar to the old stone wall, which of course was a gay bar with lesbians and everybody else where they were dancing and drinking. And of course it was tolerated by the police because it was owned according to what I heard by the mafia and the mafia paid off the police. Every once in a while, the police would show up and start smashing heads and uh, they would only leave when they had had some fun gay bashing and picked up a good number of tips uh, from the bartender. Well, it was one night, June 28, 1969, at 1.20 a.m. that a group of gays and lesbians and others had had enough. And they rose in revolt. They fought back against the police who were shaking them down, banding money, and beating up a bunch of gays and lesbians for some fun. Well, this revolution of the gays and lesbians against the police oppression became one of the most important founding events of the modern liberation movement, sexual liberation. Not just gays and lesbians, but straights and everybody else who wanted to experiment with sexuality. This was their opening call for revolution. The New York Times wrote, Eight police officers and detectives arrived at the front door announcing their intention to raid the building. Well, we all know what a police raid meant at that time. You know, pick up some money, pay off your house in the country, buy your wife a new coat. So it was not just another routine police raid and harassment of gays and other minorities, but this was a riot that attracted the attention of 
the New York Times, the other major newspapers, even the evening television news, which was a week daily ritual for most Americans. Well, June 28 became the holy day, the holiday of the gay and liberation movement. The first gay pride to celebrate it was in 1970, the following year on June 28th, when San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago all held memorial parades. You see the GLF, the Gay Liberation Front, Christopher Street Gay Liberation Day, Marching Gay Inn, Sunday, June 28th, Christopher Street Gay Liberation Day, 1970. So a new revolution was taking place, along with the uprisings in Africa against occupation by the Europeans, along with the uprisings of Palestinians and other oppressed era minority groups in other countries along with Native Americans, Chicanos, African Americans, the gay revolutionary movement took place. The GLF News, Christopher Street Liberation Day, 1970. Well, this was a newspaper and it reads, what it will all come to, no one can tell. So in 1970, they knew that something was happening. What it would come to, nobody knows. It is our hope that one, that the day will come when homosexuals will be an integral part of society, being treated as human beings. But this will not come overnight, anticipating a long battle. It can only be the result of a long, hard struggle against bigotry, prejudice, persecution, exploitation, even genocide, a word which is today very much in the news with the Americans accusing the Russians of genocide in Armenia or in Ukraine, the Turks against the Armenians in, uh, at the end of World War I, genocide in Africa, in Thailand, in Burma, in Palestine. It is very much a word in the news. The homosexual who wants to live a life of self-fulfillment in our current society has all the cards stacked against them. Politicians, corrupt police, religious leaders, parents. Gay liberation is for the homosexual who refuses to accept such a condition. Gay liberation is for the homosexual who stands up and fights back. And this was the revolutionary approach, fighting back. As in the words of Nietzsche, who doesn't destroy me, or what doesn't destroy me, makes me stronger. Well, the goal of the gay liberation movement was, was also the goal of the general sexual liberation movement. It was a rejection of binary sexuality. You had Barbie on the right, the perfect little lady, and you had um, Ken on the left, the perfect buff American male. Well, as the Bible states, and as everybody more or less agreed at the time, you were either one or the other. There was nothing in between. A girl might be humorously referred to as a tomboy, but for a guy to be referred to as a sissy or a wimp was a definite put down. You were one or the other. You joined Boy Scouts or you joined Girl Scouts. Nothing was in between. It's the perfect binary sexuality. Well, the liberation movement, the sexual liberation movement, aimed to have a recognition of sexual diversity. You could be lesbian and a woman preferring other women. Gay, a man preferring other men. 
You could be bisexual, one today, a different one, another. Transgender, you could be a man who dresses as a woman, wants to be a woman, or a woman who dresses as a man and wants to be a man. These are all valid expressions of sexuality. You had the BDSM movement, bondage, discipline, domination, and submission, sadomasochism. A lot of words which most people sort of turn up their noses against. But here again, the sexual liberation movement said, as long as you didn't harm somebody physically or yourself, these were valid role-playing, sexually stimulating activities. Or there were people who were actually asexual, meaning they just had no sexual drive for anybody. Fetishes were celebrated. Some people were into older people, some people into much younger people. Many white guys wanted black men and many black women wanted white people. A handicapped cross-dressing religion would be a fetish. Couple plus one, a man and a woman, or two men or two women who are a couple, bringing in a third person. Bodily functions, animals, sex toys, body openings, feet, porno, food, fat, hair. Each of these eventually had their clubs. They had their newsletter. Later on, they have today their website. Uh, and they have conventions uh, where people of a similar interest will gather at a big hotel in Washington, D.C. or San Francisco and celebrate their particular sexual um, fantasies. Fantasy, rape, prison, being in a convent, a monk in a monastery, cadavers, children, slavery. These were all possible fantasies. Now, once again, the word fantasy doesn't mean that you're going to go out and rape people, but you may role play and a woman or a man might take great pleasure in pretending to be raped. That's why it's called fantasy. Well, all of these different sexually liberated groups, of course, sought out a homeland, a chosen land, just like the Puritans way back in the colonial times sought to build their city on a hilltop in colonial Massachusetts. De Tocqueville, the French writer on American early culture in the early 1800s, actually described the United States as a new creation, a new Garden of Eden, where a new liberated people was going to emerge. Now, of course, he wasn't interested in sexual liberation, but for his time, it was a political liberation. The American Bible Society, again, build a Bible reading society without priests and without churches and without bishops and without theologies and without rabbis and synagogues. But every American sitting with his or her Bible, reading it, and creating a new Bible reading uh, society. The Oneida community, the Mormons, all created their own religious movements. The Oneida community in upstate New York died out, but the Mormons these days are thriving. Manifest destiny. The United States had a great destiny, not only geographic in North America, but to spread the light of freedom and light around the world. The Statue of Liberty has nothing to do with immigration. It has to do with spreading American liberty around the world. That's why the Statue of Liberty faces out to the ocean, not to America. The war to end all wars, World War I, and Following World War II, the American way of life. So Americans have always had this sort of messianic, this utopian approach to their own country. We were different from other countries. We were a new creation with a divine destiny. And the American way of life 
is a way of life to be emulated by the world. So the gays started fleeing their closets in Idaho and in Oklahoma and in Maine and Georgia and migrating to the great cities where by sheer numbers, they could take over Christopher Street. They could take over areas of San Francisco, Chicago, areas in other great cities where they built their ethnic communities. Well, of course, you had your parade in June, which was a tradition of every ethnic community. You had the freedom to dress up as a nun or wear makeup or get into an s &M club or to any other kinky, exciting role that you wanted to play. In the ethnic neighborhood, nobody looked at you. If you were a woman on one side, and a man on the other side. That's what the, uh, eth the that's what the um, gay and lesbian ethnic neighborhood was all about. Films were being produced. Pink Flamingo, one of the wildest of the gay cult films. Cora de Brest in France, um, a great film based on the novel by Jean Genet. Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, an Australian movie celebrating the rise of gay liberation in Australia. Robert De Niro's Taxi Driver very eloquently and controversially displayed the underside of this emerging gay ghetto in the major cities various clubs and there was a club a magazine a newsletter for everybody girth and mirth was for as you can see oversized guys beginning in san francisco in boston by 1978 new york had its own movement with their own magazines their own gatherings and it was something that didn't shock anybody because in Christopher Street or in the village of the other cities of the United States, nobody even did a double take anymore. It was totally acceptable. Gay resorts started being created. Cherry Grove out on Fire Island was one of the wildest places uh, where gays and lesbians and their friends could gather and have hotels, which were reserved for one group or the other, parades, you could dress up, you could be as silly as you wanted to. You had areas in the dunes where you could go naked and all kinds of resorts. Well, here again, don't forget, a lot of money was at play. Gays were not raising children, putting them through college, sending them to private schools. They were spending their money on themselves. The baby boom generation was the most highly educated generation in American history. We were earning money and we were spending it on ourselves. The village people, one of the great groups celebrating the wild times at the YMCA. It's fun to stay at the YMCA. There's a place you can go where you're short on your dough. You can stay there and I'm sure you'll find many ways to have a good time. So the new gay ghetto had an entire ethnic infrastructure. The Metropolitan Community Church was established for gays and lesbians, celebrating gay marriages. The gay flag was popular by 1978. Magazines such as The Blade, Gay Men's Chorus, every city had a men's chorus. Gay community centers, SAGE, 
as the baby boomers started aging, uh, you had sage for older and getting older gay people. The saunas such as St. Mark's, the Continental Baths, where Bette Midler got her uh, start as an entertainer. Everhard Bar on West 28, the piers at the end of Christopher Street. This was all part of the infrastructure of a city within a city. And we won't even talk about movie theaters. We'll talk about restaurants, coffee shops, bars, you name it. This was part of every ethnic neighborhood. Christopher Street had its manhole and Hellfire Club. The Rambles in Central Park were a famous meeting place for gays. Mineshaft, one of the wild bars, the Eagle. Every city in America had its Eagle Bar and even in foreign countries. Gays would stake out an area where straight people weren't going, the police didn't bother with it, and they would turn it into a summertime sunbathing area. So the whole ethnic neighborhood emerged. Young people were leaving their homes in the Midwest or in small towns, gravitating in the larger cities. Many married men who were raising baby boom children suddenly discovered that they too had certain inclinations. And of course, classic case of a divorce, the wife angry, abandoning, the man abandons the wife and kids very often and ends up leading a new life in one of the gay cities within a city. Well, what began and what really flowered in the United States gradually started spreading worldwide. First, it started attracting a lot of straight people. John Travolta up there dancing. I mean, uh, Bette Midler and so many other uh, straight people or people who were just curious found that life and the nights in a gay bar were absolutely unrivaled in any straight bar. Gay is chic became the slogan. Studio 54, Plato's Retreat were wild bars and clubs and social centers where almost anything went, whether you were straight, gay, lesbian, or whatever. Magazines started mentioning that certain people were gay and they saw no reason to hide it. Andy Warhol, Truman Capote, um, uh, the architects, uh, Paul Johnson, Frank Bar uh, Barney Frank from Boston, the politician, Leonard Bernstein. These were not gay people sneaking around, living in a closet and coming out periodically, but these were people who let the world know that they are gay, and this is part of their identity. You had your revolutionary movement, the National March on Washington for Gay and Lesbian uh, and for Lesbian and Gay Rights of October 11, 1987. Look at the slogan, come out, come out wherever you are. Get out of the closet, get out of your small town, get out of your church if you don't want to remain a preacher. Get out of the synagogue if you're a rabbi and the, the community will not accept you. Come to Washington. And so it was a gay liberation. And as books like Beyond Gay or Straight, and beyond straight and gay marriage said, well, you don't have to identify yourself as gay or straight. 
you don't have to define yourself as a lesbian or a straight person. Discover your own sexuality. And if it doesn't exist, invent a name for it and say, this is my sexuality. So it's come out of the binary system where there's only male and female, and even coming out of the binary system of gay and straight, meaning those are just two names, but there are thousands of other possible sexual expressions. Well, gradually the American style gay and sexual liberation movement started sweeping around the world. Liberated and somewhat tolerant cities such as Geneva, Switzerland, um, and easily accepted the gay uh, liberation movement, even though the uh, city of John Calvin was not exactly welcoming it, but the gays carved out their own bars and their own neighborhoods. Some places like Russia and Mexico and China and Egypt, because of religious reasons, of course, resisted the gay movement. Other places like Mexico found that there was money to be made. So open up a gay bar, people pay an admission, the um, police come, get their payoff, and everybody ends up happy. And so the gay movement started spreading around the world. When I was in Moscow for a year in 1992, you started having gay parade in Moscow with the American gay um, flag, the June Gay Pride Parade. In Africa, certain countries such as South Africa itself started becoming more liberal and even recognizing gay rights in their constitution. In China, periodically you would have gay prides, especially in the area of Hong Kong. Tel Aviv started having its big gay parades down Dizen Gulf and this Postcard says, gay Israel, gay capital of the Middle East. And so the American gay liberation, sexual liberation movement started spreading worldwide. Well, by the 1980s, the situation began to change. Various Republican movements, Various religious leaders, especially from the evangelical right wing. Certain Catholic leaders started finding out that this liber sexual liberation was infecting their priests and their nuns. And so the wild times of the 60s and 70s started having anti-gay back. The AIDS epidemic, probably one of the most disastrous uh, effects of this wild sexual permissive culture, started having its effects. At Robertson and other religious leaders actually called AIDS God's punishment for sin. The Republican Party started courting the religious right, the, and going against liberated women, going against gays and lesbians, and even calling for the shutting down of saunas and bars and clubs. This was mainly the Republican movement. American nationalism started turning increasingly right wing. We are one nation under God. We do trust in God. And so we must be God-like. Fundamentalists, evangelical, Pentecostal Christians uh, reacted strongly against this gay liberation movement. Mainstream religions, on the other hand, took 
various stances. The Episcopal Church started ordaining men and women who were gay and lesbian, even electing them religious leaders. Other churches, such as the Baptists, uh, were viciously opposed to gays. Catholic Church remained opposed, but tried to accept them to a limited degree. Well, another factor that severely affected the gay communities uh, in the major cities was under the guise of urban renewal. 42nd Street in New York, which was a big gay area with all the uh, porno movie theaters and bars and clubs. Under Ayatollah Giuliani, the move was made to shut them down, redevelop them, hand them over to Hollywood and to Disneyland and make some money. The piers at the end of 14th Street in Manhattan sticking out into the Hudson River were gradually shut down and the government claiming that they were unsafe, which they definitely were, but still uh, they had tolerated wild parties out there for years until under the guise of urban renewal, it was decided to shut down these areas. Hmm. Well, the United States had a long history of assimilating new people into the American mainstream. The Irish Catholics, when they first came over, people like Thomas Nast made up horrific cartoons condemning the Catholics as being non-democratic, authoritarian, illiterate, speaking only Gaelic but yet gradually the Irish entered the mainstream of America. The Germans, whether they were Catholic, Protestants, or Jews, Eastern European Orthodox Jews became part of the American mainstream. The Italians also joined the mainstream of American society. And during the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, African Americans started entering the mainstream of American society. In 1965, with the opening of the gates of immigration, millions of Chinese, Hispanics, African, Middle Easterners, Asians started coming to the United States, and it was hoped that they too would become part of the mainstream American society. Well, many people thought that the gays and the lesbians and other sexual minorities could be assimilated into American society. And they would become just the family down the street, the family in the church or synagogue beside you. And this process of dumping the gays and lesbians into the melting pot, which had assimilated so many people before, would end up domesticating the gays. I love this cartoon on the right. Gays and lesbians getting married. My God, haven't these poor people suffered enough. Here again, this was the goal of many straight people and a certain number of gay people as well. Preachers started saying, well, gays should give up their wild sexual activities, get married, come to the church or synagogue, we'll bless your marriage. You can adopt or find kids or have kids and become just a variant on the traditional Judeo-Christian family unit. Government started legalizing gay marriages or gay unions of some sort. And the goal was to become a couple just like the couple down the street. Rather than mom, pop, and the kids, it was dad, pop, and the kids. Kids would go to school, talking about my two dads or my two moms. If you couldn't have kids, gay adoption was a possibility. 
join the PTA. Well, you were parents after all. It doesn't distinguish between male or female or gay or straight. And many people started demanding the right of military, of gays and lesbians to join the military. And so the instruments for taming gays, domesticating gays, don't forget the word domesticate, comes from domus in Latin, which means house. So take the gays and lesbians out of their bars, off of the piers, out of their saunas and out of their forests and gay resorts, put them in a house in the suburbs and turn them into just ordinary domesticated Americans. The goal was army, marriage, children. Well, this was controversial because many very devout Christians and Jews said that gayness was antithetical to the, in, the uh, Judeo-Christian family, saying that the male and female and kids model was the model for human society, a stable society. I once was at a dinner party in Miami and a big politician was talking and said, oh, the gay people must be so happy because now they're allowed to join the army, they're allowed to get married, they're allowed to have or adopt children. Well, there was one gay guy at the party and he says, oh yeah, Senator, I believe it was. He said, that's something I've always wanted to do. Join the army and go off to the war in Vietnam get married and sit at home every evening, paying off three cars a house and raising children, spending my eve Friday and Saturday evenings home, babysitting and changing poopy baby dieties. But this was the social attempt to destroy a unique singles liberated gay and lesbian lifestyle and force them to conform to the heterosexual model. <clears throat> of course, not all people agreed that a gay couple could ever be assimilated. Uh, Anita Bryant on the left of Newsweek was one of the vicious opponents of gay liberation and the, and the normalization of the gay experience. Many Christians said we will never admit a married gay couple with or without children. And of course, referring to Mark, said Gospel of St. Mark, God made them male and female and said a man shall be joined to his wife. Biblical marriage remained the goal. So while certain people advocated for increased gay and lesbian rights to join the army, get married, have children, mainstream society was still animated by another group of people who were viciously anti-gay and had no intention whatsoever of admitting gays into mainstream society. The anti-gay movement really accelerated during the 1980s. And this was when the AIDS pandemic swept the country. Reverend Pat Robertson said that gay people spread AIDS on purpose out of their anger and as a, and uh, against society, showing that gay people were, in essence, a mentally abhorrent group of people. Phil Robertson, who was a famous actor in this dreadful TV series called Duck Dynasty, said that diseases like AIDS are God's punishment for immoral behavior. And so in spite of the efforts to bring gays and lesbians and other sexual minorities into the mainstream, 
there was so much opposition. And this opposition is only increasing as I speak. Ron DeSantis of Florida, once again, one of the big opponents of gay and lesbian rights, uh, uh, returning to the Christian evangelical fundamental family. In fact, as I speak, is currently locked in a war with Disneyland in Orlando, Florida, which um, has opposed many of his acts and laws to remove discussion of gays and lesbians from the school system. St. Donald Trump, another person who has encouraged this anti-gay movement, if not personally encouraging the anti-gay movement, but making the evangelical Christians and Pentecostal Christians uh, the centerpiece of his political movement. And so the question of what is going to happen in the future of gays. Many people say that throughout history, there have been periods such as the Weimar Republic in Germany, such as after the French Revolution, such as after the Russian Revolution in 1917, when there was a period of sexual liberation where the people were interested in individual freedoms, but they all ended up being snuffed out. In Germany, it was Hitler. In Russia, it was Stalin, where the gay movement flourished, had a brilliant culture, and then was snuffed out and it was back into the closets, if not outright persecution. So many people are asking, is this the end of gays? Will they once again become the invisible minority locked in their closets, sneaking around um, places where they can meet other people? What is going to be the future? Well, who decides? Well, it can be um, uh, Governor DeSantis in Florida. It can be Donald Trump in the White House. It can be the ultra right wing Supreme Court that we have today. And so many people are actually arguing that the golden age of gay liberation, which began in the 60s and 70s, is gradually coming to an end, and that it will mark the end of gay liberation. Well, on that serious note, I would like to thank you for joining me. And I would like to remind you that in many countries, Groups like Amnesty International are reporting on vicious persecution of sexual minorities. Many African countries are enacting laws against trans people, gays, lesbians, gay bars. In Mexico, there's a movement under the current evangelical Protestant president uh, uh, who is trying to make Mexico Christian again. Countries like Brazil, which had a great reputation for free wheel sexuality, now under Bolsonaro, another evangelical Protestant, the situation is getting bad. In Russia under Putin, definitely not a paradise. The brief flowering of sexual liberation in the early 90s with the collapse of the Soviet Union is now giving away to outright persecution. So thank you very much for joining me today. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me at ronbrownmedia at gmail.com. And I love criticism. I love suggestions. Seems every time I give a presentation such as this, as soon as it's done, 
I realize that I made so many mistakes, I tear it apart and I redo it. Then I'll give the same talk again someplace else, and it will once again be torn apart, updated, and certain ideas changed. So I would love to thank you, I'd like to thank you very much for joining me today. And I hope to see you sometime in the future for another exciting lecture on some hot topic in the world today. So thank you. This is Dr. Ronald Brown logging off. Thank you again for joining me.